Father, we just thank you. We honor you, Lord, once again for the privilege. It's a privilege, Lord, to stand before your people. Lord, we never take it lightly, but we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that you provide to share your heart with these, your people. Lord, thank you for the anointing. And not only rest upon me, Lord, but upon your people. Lord, may I articulate your heart and your mind clearly. And Lord, we thank you that not only, Lord, will we receive your word, but may your word transform us. We thank you, Lord, for every person under the sound of my voice. God, speak to us. Lord, even that we're here today, Lord, to share a word that is catered towards men, you speak to the man, the spirit man in all of us. God, we thank you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless the Lord. Happy Father's Day to all of the men once again. Thank God for all of you. I really do. It's not, it's not easy being a father. There's so many expectations, uh, so many demands. And one of the things, things that I think fathers do so well and are, I mean, just hard-pressed at doing it, is trying to make sure that they can provide for their families and I want you just to stand for a moment. You need to be honored for that. It's not easy. It's not easy. Amen. Come on, sisters. Give them a hand clap of praise. Because there's a lot of pressure on, on fathers just trying to fulfill that role along with the other many things that go along with fathering. But men have such an arduous job of trying to make sure that they can provide for their families. And you guys, every one of you in this room, I know y'all work hard. You do it, I mean, to the glory and honor of God. So that has to go without not being recognized. We recognize that this morning. And we're going to deal with some things, I believe, in the Scripture that's going to help us even enhance being the fathers and men that God has called us to be. Amen? Bless the Lord. God bless you. I want to talk from this subject Men after God's own heart. Amen. Men after God's own heart. And sisters, I believe that you're going to get something out of this too because uh, when God speaks, he speaks to the spirit of a person. Amen. Although uh, God has a unique role for both uh, man and woman in his plan, there is something vitally important uh, for men pertaining to God's will and purpose for the, the man in terms of his, in his creative order of things. But I want to use David uh, as an example, a little bit of Moses' life as, as well, to demonstrate that you don't have to be a man, I'm going to include the sisters too, a man or woman after God's own heart and seek to be perfect. I'm going to say that again. You don't have to be a man or woman at the God's own heart and seek to be perfect. Because even David was not perfect, but God called him a man after his own heart. What it comes down to is we simply have to want to obey God and live out his will. So God sees into us that there's a willingness both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So God himself sees within us that we can be men after his own heart. And I want to use some things that I believe characterizes a man after God's own heart. To carry that distinction is heavy, very heavy. And so it's a subtitle, Men in Pursuit of Pleasing God. How many of y'all are here, brothers and sisters alike, you're in pursuit a pleasing God. Amen. And if we continue to live this way every day, then we will be men and women after God's own heart. Now, let's look at David uh, for, for a bit here. I want us to go over to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13. First Samuel chapter 13. 
And I want to read verses 1 down to 14. See, whenever God begins to look at David, and he says that David is a man after his own heart, he contrasts David's heart, his actions, his conduct, and his life in comparative to someone else. And in this case, being Saul. And here in chapter 13, it says, Saul reigned one year. And when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Mishmash and in the Mount of Bethel. And 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was at Gibeah or Jibba. And the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines. And that Israel also had in an, uh, an abomination with the Philistines. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and the people as the sand which was on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched at Mishmash, eastward of Beth Aven. And when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, in other words, in a tight place, I mean, you, you know, the true essence of who you are come, comes out when you're in a tight place. Amen. And so for the people were distressed. Then the people did hide themselves in caves and thickets and rocks and high places and in the pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. How many of you know that people follow a leader? And so Paul is trembling. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal. And so the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, so the people are scattered. The people are, are going away from this leader because he is literally demonstrating that he is not fearless in the midst of a straightened or tight situation. And so Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and a peace offering. Here Saul is about to take on the role of the priest or the prophet. This is reserved just for Samuel or the priest because Samuel operated as a priest as well. And he offered the burnt offering and it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering, that the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, what hast thou done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me. So he was more concerned about the people than the will of God. This is what's going to separate Saul from David. So God calls David a man after his own heart because even though David wasn't perfect, there was something in David that wanted to fulfill the will of God. Come on, tell your name as a neighbor. Even though I'm not perfect. I want to fulfill the will of God. There's something in us. Amen. Even when we miss it, that when you truly are sold out to God, that there is something on the inside of you that, that yearns to fulfill God's will. As a matter of fact, that even when we do miss it, you know, we, we feel you should feel bad about it. Most of the time we do feel bad about it because we want to please God. And so. This was not the case with Saul. And so Saul said, because I saw the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and the Philistines gathered themselves together at Mishmash, therefore I said, notice I said, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced, <laughs> I forced myself therefore, look how that sounds, I forced myself. No, you couldn't hold yourself back. So I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, 
Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now the kingdom shall not continue. The Lord have sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord have commanded him to be captain of his people because thou has not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. You would know that God knows all things. So he already knew what was going to transpire in David's life. God knowing what would happen in David's life, he says automatically, I have sought me a man after my own heart. So God even looks over. He knows the beginning from the end. He looks over the fault that is going to transpire in David's life. And he says, I found me a replacement for you, Saul. He's a man after my own heart. Tell your neighbors, neighbor, neighbor. God can still use you with your mess. <laughs> God looks at the heart. So watch this. I want to give you a little context. So David was a man after God's own heart that he was truly thankful. He was a thank. Look at all the Psalms. You see, you see David always bringing his attention back to the Lord. And all that David went through, he was always grateful. He was thanking the Lord. So number one, this is what characterizes people or men after God's own heart. They are thankful. There's a lot of people that don't have gratitude. That, that cannot be thankful or express thanksgiving unto God for all that he does, even the good and the bad. But when you know him, you become thankful and grateful because things could be worse than it is. So you learn to become thankful. I have, David says, I have washed my hands in innocence and go about your altar, O Lord, proclaiming out loud your praise and telling all of your wonderful deeds. That's in Psalm 26, verse 6 to 7. David's life was marked by seasons of great peace and so are ours and prosperity. How many know that God gives you peace and prosperity, but you also have times of fear and despair? So there's a perfect balance and you need both because you not only need to be thankful when things are going well, but you learn how, you got to need to learn how to be thankful when things are not going well. So he gives us both. He gives us peace and prosperity and he gives us times of fear and despair. But through all of the seasons in his life, he never forgot to thank the Lord for everything he had. So thankfulness marks a man who's after God's own heart. It is truly one of David's greatest characteristics. He said this in, in Psalm 100, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. As followers of Jesus Christ, we would do well to follow David's lead of offering praise through thanksgiving unto the Lord. So this also marks a man, and I'm going to include you sisters, and a woman who is a person after God's own heart. You learn to exhibit thankfulness. So after he sinned, David was truly repentant. David's sin with Bathsheba was recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 2 to 5. The mighty, fall, uh, uh, the mighty fall hard, and David's fall included adultery, lying, and murder. Now think about that. God saw all of that, and he still said, David is a man after my own heart. That's mercy. Somebody shout, that's mercy. And so uh, I love this. He had sinned against God. And he admits it. That's what makes you and I, <laughs> I know we can cover our sin. We, we, we can hide. But see, the moment we sin, but we admit it, God said, that's the kind of heart I like right there. That's the, con that's the contrite heart. That's, a, that's the kind of heart look, God says, I cannot do without. So this is what makes us people after God's own heart, that when we sin, we can admit it. So David admits it. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. So he's, he's not only remorseful, but he's repented. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You should not die. But admitting all our sin is asking, uh, let me put it this way, but admitting our sin and asking for forgiveness is only half of the equation. The other half is repentance. 
The other half is repentance. And David did that well. Psalm 51 characterizes uh, David's sin of adultery uh, with Bathsheba. And as a result, God uh, literally takes his son at the same time. But David, in, in, in that Psalm 51, and we're going to deal with some of that, it shows David's heart. It shows his heart. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to thy steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. So in conclusion, David was a man after God's own heart because he demonstrated his faith and was committed to following the Lord. That's what characterizes us as men after God's own heart. We demonstrate our faith. We demonstrate our faith under pressure. We demonstrate that we can not only trust God, but we can be trusted. God can trust us. Amen. Yes, his faith was tested on a grand scale, and he fell at times. But after his sin, he sought and received the Lord's forgiveness. And in the final analysis, David loved God's law. This is what you want to get. David loved God's law. Thy law have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. David loved God's law and sought it to follow it and sought to follow it exactly. As a man after God's own heart, David is a role model for you and I. So watch this statement. God is not looking for perfect sinless men. He is looking for men who have who can be pliable. I'm going to say it again. God is not looking for perfect sinless men. He is looking for men's hearts that can become pliable. In other words, God says, I, I know you're imperfect, but can I work with your heart? Can I work in your heart? Can, can you incline your heart to me? Can, can I make you a tender man? Can I, can I work in your heart? Can I, can, can I work in you to the degree that you begin to incline your heart towards my will? No matter how imperfect you are, can you incline your heart to me? And so God looks for that. He, he looks for us to become pliable, uh, 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 easily bent or flexible. We, we have to be pliable or easily influenced. So God looks in our lives, and he, he knows that, that we're imperfect. But when he begins to deal with us, when he begins to work with us, when he begins to influence, when the Holy Spirit begins to nudge, there's something in us that wants to please him. We find ourselves yielding back to the will of God. Yes. Come on, say amen. amen. I believe we have that kind of man in here, yes, those kind of men in here. So David was not a perfect man, but he found the secret to personal purity. I'm going to say it again. David was not a perfect man, but he found the secret to to personal purity. Come on, watch this now. He found the secret to personal purity. And it's a word called repentance. <laughs> because repentance always restores. Say that with me. Repentance always restores. So God's man pursues personal purity. How many of y'all are in pursuit of that? Amen. Amen. Listen, glory to God. We have a man, we have a whole lot of stuff trying to influence us. If you don't pursue personal purity, some other stuff gonna pursue you. Amen. Bless the Lord. So so watch this now in Psalm 51, verse 2 to 7. Look at look at look at David, because Psalm 51 is really uh, David's acknowledgement and restoration from the sin of adultery with Bathsheba. And here in Psalm 51, verse 2 to 7, he says, wash me thoroughly from mine. God, don't miss not one iota of my life. Go into the deep recesses of my soul. God, whatever it is that's in my heart, wash me thoroughly. Then he says, cleanse me from my sin. He says, for I acknowledge my transgression." And my sin is ever before me. And then this is the statement. He says, against thee and thee only have I sinned 
and done this evil in thy sight. See, when, 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 it, when we begin to realize that when we sin, it is against God, then the weight of that thing comes on us in a greater measure that we, we, we begin to see how it is that we offend God and something on the inside of us says, I don't want to offend you like that, God, because this is not just a sin against me, it's a sin against you. He says, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. He says, that thou mightest be justified when thou speedest to God. You're always right. And be clear when thou judges. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. I, I love David because he's reminding God, God, you know. <laughs> You know when I was born, I was born into iniquity. You know these proclivities are already inside of me. He says, God, I was born. So he says, behold, I was shaping in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, but thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Then he says, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. So David found the secret to personal purity, and it was repentance. He immediately began to repent. He immediately began to acknowledge his transgression. And the moment we begin to acknowledge, as opposed to hide, God sees that we are men after his own heart. So here's what characterized David's life, humility and brokenness. Humility and brokenness before God mocks a man who would be characterized as being a man after God's own heart. Look at verse 16 to 17. Look at what David says. For thou desireth not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delighteth not in burnt offering. So he says, listen, under, under, under the law, under, under that system, there was a system for, for all offenses. There was cleansing for everything. But there was no provision for what David had did. And so he says, you didn't desire this. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh, God, thou will not despise. So God says, that's something that I will not look past. Brokenness, humility and brokenness. And that's what David acknowledged. A man that is broken before God will always have the joy of God's salvation restored to their lives. There is no place in a person's life that the mercy of God cannot reach. Don't you thank God for that? And so another thing that characterizes a man after God's own heart is this. A man after God's own heart has found God's priority for their life. How I many know there are many things that, 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 that we, can, we can place importance on? But once we find that one thing, amen, that one thing that, that, that you know is tied to God's will for your life, that will make you a man after God's own heart because all of your energy is given to that one thing. And here is that one thing, a relationship with God Almighty. That's, that's the one thing that, that, that we have to make priority in our life is a relationship with God. And God is looking for men in this hour that, that, that want a relationship with him. Look at Psalm 27 verse 4. Let me go there in my Bible. I just got verse 4. But when you look at Psalm 27, you can see how David begins to express the priority in his life. How many when you got the priority right, everything else is right? When you got the first thing in place, everything else falls into place. Psalm 27. And as men, as fathers, we, we, we have to fight. We have to fight to make sure that the number one thing is the number one thing. Say that with me. The number one thing is the number one thing. Look at Psalm 27. 
David says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Then he says, verse 4, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For you and I, as fathers and men, the priority of God's presence right. is the number one thing. Right. We have to fight to stay in God's presence. Tell your neighbors and neighbor, men and women alike, you have to fight to stay in God's presence. So David says, one thing I have decided, desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. This is a beautiful picture of David longing for the presence of the Lord. A man after God's own heart is a man who desperately needs and pursues God's presence in his life. And this is what God is looking for in this hour. He's looking for men who will pursue his presence. In another place, David states the following about God's presence in Psalm 84, verse 2 to 5 in the Amplified Bible. He says, my soul yearns. Yes, even pines and is homesick for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out and sing for joy for the living God. Yes, the sparrow have found a house and the swallow a nest for herself. So David is saying, listen, you know how important the presence of God is? Sparrows. They go and build their nests in the house of the Lord right there in God's presence. Where she may lay her young, even your altars. So there's a comparison. He says, O Lord of hosts, my king, my God, blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied are those who dwell in your house and your presence. They will be singing your praises all day long. Selah, pause and calmly think on that. Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied is the man whose strength is in you and whose hard are the ways of Highways to Zion. And so for you and I, as men, if we're going to be men after God's own heart, we must make the presence of God our priority. Yeah. Fight for it. Do whatever you have to do. You know, I know seasons come and seasons go, just like in my life right now. It's crazy. You know, I would love to spend an hour in the prayer closet like, like I used to. But because my life is so busy, I have to learn how to find God's presence wherever I am. I have to learn how to commune with the Spirit of God wherever I am. So David saw the presence of God as his source of life. So brothers, God's presence is your source of life. Back to Psalm 51 once more. Notice what David says, Psalm 51, verse 1. He says, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So David puts not only priority on the presence of God, but importance on the presence of God. He knows that he is nothing without God's presence. So you can't, you can't not include Moses in the same paradigm because Moses... He begins to express to you and I how important God's presence is as well. And here in Exodus chapter 33, verse 13 to 15, I love what Moses says. He says, now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way. Well, guess what? You know, in any, anytime we want to know where to go, it's always going to be revealed to us in God's presence. Moses says, show me thy way. So God gives us the instruction on how to find our way. It's always in his presence. He says, show me thy way that I may know thee and that I may find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, if 
thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. So Moses says, listen, your presence is so important, God. If you ain't going to be there, I don't want to be there. If you're not going with me, I can't go. It, it is far better to go somewhere with God than to go nowhere without him. So a man after God's heart is also consumed with a passion for his house. So, we don't need to be perfect. We just need to be pliable. That's my first one. We don't need to be perfect. We just need to be pliable. Pliable. We need to understand personal purity. We need to understand humility and brokenness. We need to understand God being our priority. And now, we need to become men of passion. Men of passion. Men of passion. So watch this. Men of passion. So a man after God's heart is consumed by a passion for God's house. Write this down somewhere in your notes. Passion always creates action. If you have passion, you'll always be called to action. Whatever you're passionate towards, it always moves you to action. And here in Psalm 69, David prophesying about Christ Psalm 69, verse 9, NOT, it says this. Passion for your house has consumed me, and the insults of those who insulted you have fallen on me. So passion is zeal. God loves a man who's full of zeal for him, zeal for the things of God. I, I'd rather have zeal for the things of God and look crazy to somebody else and have no fire or passion. Because sometimes people attack people who have passion. Because a lot of people are passionless, which means they are not going anywhere. And so passion always moves you to action. And God wants men in his house, men after his own heart to be men of passion, men of, who are passionate for him, men who are passionate for the things of God. And men who are so passionate, they don't care if they look foolish. To people, but not foolish to God. So it's a zeal. It's defined as passion, energy, devotion. Another word for passion is devotion. You're devoted. Jesus' passion for purity caused him to drive out the money changers in his father's house. In John chapter 2, verse 13 to 17, it says the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small courts, he drove them all out of the temple. That was passion in action. Say it with me. That was passion in action. And so Jesus uh, uh, got so passionate that a righteous indignation came on him. And the sheep in the auction and poured out the changes money and overthrew the tables and said unto those that sold doves, take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house have eaten me up. So passion for God's house translates into a man having a devoted heart for the things of God. You know, there's times that we need to say, Lord, rekindle my passion so I can become more devoted to the, when, when my heart drifts, God, rekindle my passion. That's Psalm 61. The kind of passion will create a righteous indignation for things that takes the purity away from God's house and God's people. This kind of passion creates the fuel for the making of a watchman in God's house. In other words, we begin not, not, only, not only God's house, but you become a watchman 
over your own house. Amen. As a father, as a man, passion for the things of God manifesting not only in your house. Listen, man, there's many intruders that will come, try to come enter into your house. And it's your zeal, your passion for the things of God that's going to cause you to go into action and address the intruder. Come on. Listen, man, sometimes the devil shows up the same way Jesus had to go through that temple and, 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 and overturn the tables and, and the money chambers and, and use a scourge of whips and drive. The, listen, your passion will cause you to drive stuff out of your environment. You can't be passive. You got to be passionate. Come on, say amen. So God looked for men who are full of passion, full of fire. Amen. Who can be aroused to righteous indignation. I want to be like David. Glory to God. Amen. David was aroused to righteous indignation when Goliath showed up. Glory to God. When Goliath shows up at your house, when he shows up in your situations, you got to be aroused with righteous indignation. Come on, man. We have men like that in here today. I got some Goliaths trying to attack me right now, Pastor, coming out of left field. Trying to attack my finances, man, like crazy. But listen, man, I'm about to cut Goliath's head off. Glory to God. I'm going to take my five smooth stones. Glory to God. And I know I'm going to hit the mark right between his eyes. And then I'm going to take it. I'm going to take what he would have used and cut his head off. Come on, man. That's, that's your word right there. So this kind of passion creates the fuel for the making of a watchman in the house of God and even over your own house as a father. This type of man confronts all intruders with a defiance like David confronting Goliath or Jesus confronting the money changers in his father's house. This generation needs men of passion. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's look at this story real quick. I'm almost done. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 34 to 37. And David said to Saul, and this is when Goliath shows up, the armies of Israel are on one side of the valley, the Philistines are on the other side, and Goliath is in the middle taunting the children of Israel. And David said unto Saul, verse 34, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took, a, took the lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and I smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I love that. And when he rose up against me, I caught him by the beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. How many know that there is some passion coming out of David? And David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And I'm declaring that God is going to deliver us out of some stuff that's confronting us right now. We're not going to be passive. We're going to be full of passion. We're going to address this stuff in the spirit. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. And he took his staff in his hand and rose with five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a script. And his sling was in his hand, and he, and he drew near to the Philistine. Look at verse 40 to 46. And the Philistine came out and drew near to David and the man that bare the shield before him. And when the Philistine uh, looked out about and David and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said, Come on, we're going to say something. And David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and a spear and a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day I, he said, 
said, this day the Lord delivered thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give, uh, give the, carcasses of the, uh, the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowl of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. So as fathers and men and, 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 and sistering, we got to be full of passion. Sistering. <laughs> so God is not looking for you and I to be perfect as we work out our salvation. He's looking for you and I to be passionate in our pursuit of his purpose. I'm going to say it again. God is not looking for you and I to be perfect as we work out our salvation. He is looking for you and I to be passionate in our pursuit of his purpose. Because if we keep pursuing his purpose, glory to God, he's going to keep cleansing us. He's going to keep giving us mercy. He's going to keep giving us grace. So men of great passion are used for great purposes in God's house. A man after God's own heart is noted for being a man or a or God's man. I'm going to say it again. Being a man of God or God's man. I, you know something? I, I want to say this to you right now. Do you know the highest honor that can be bestowed upon you and I is to be a man of God? That's right. To be a bona fide man of God. Because there's weight behind that. A true man of God call, carries the weight and the glory of the backing of heaven on his life. So the greatest honor that can be bestowed upon any man is to be noted as a man of God. This distinction carries a great recognition of honor and integrity as the standard surpassing all earthly awards and acknowledgments. I would rather be called a man of God than be called anything else. So this is why David was characterized as being a man after God's own heart. Here's the point. A man after God's heart chooses the will of God, even if it means he will suffer. Even if it means he will suffer. Look at Hebrews. I got to go to Moses again. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 to 26, and I'm almost done. Faith enabled Moses to choose God's will. So what do we need? We need faith. Faith helps you and I to choose. Trust helps you and I to choose the will of God. For although he was raised as Pharaoh's, uh, uh, as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he refused to be, uh, to, he refused to make his identity, choosing instead to suffer mistreatment with the people of God. Moses preferred faith's certainty above the monetary enjoyment of sin's, the momentary enjoyment of sin's pleasure. This is the TPT. He found, watch this now, he found his true wealth in suffering abuse for being anointed. Mm, 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 mm. I'm going to say that again. Watch this now. He found his true wealth in suffering abuse for being anointed. So sometimes you don't even know why you're, being, you, you're suffering. It's because you're anointed. Why are you going through so much? It's because you are anointed. In other words, you have the ability by God's aid and help to do the greatest damage on Satan's kingdom. So now, now everything has to come against you. It says more than anything that the world could offer him for his eyes look with wonder not on the immediate, but on the ultimate, which was faith's reward. So a man after God's heart is a man of great devotion. Devotion to God implies ardent affection for him. God looks for men who are going to be affectionate. Not only passionate, but affectionate. In other words, you, you can be emotional with God. You can get mushy. You can cry. It means yielding your heart to him in reference, faith or piety. So a man after God's heart is not ashamed to express his devotion 
to God and worship, even if others despise the way he worships. And I'm closing with this. In the account of David, where the ark is restored back to his rightful place there in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 12 through 6, it says, And it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Dedim and all that pertaineth unto him because the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Dedim into the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they had bared the ark, had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatland. And David danced. Here it is. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girt with the linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michelle, Saul's daughter, which was David's wife, looked through the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. What was it about David? David was not afraid to worship God out of his devotion for God, even though it caused someone to despise him for the way he worshiped. And lastly, a man after God's own heart is a man of principle. And it simply means that you have values. You're a man of principles. You, 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 don't, you don't push your values aside to meet the situation. You're a man of principle. And here in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, it says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee. And here it is. Here's your principles. Do justly, love mercy, and walk before the Lord thy God humbly. And walk before the Lord thy God humbly. And so I want, I want, I want the men, I want you to stand with me in this season that we're going to allow God to do something powerful in our lives. We want to make a commitment to allow the Lord to work in us to such a degree that we're declaring unto the Lord, we're, fresh, we're making a fresh commitment to be men after your own heart. And so in order for that to really begin to come into fruition to the degree that I believe the Lord wants to do it, is he's got to have our heart. He must possess our hearts. And one of the ways that God begins to take possession of our hearts is that his word must consume our hearts. And then what happens is, is God causes within us both a willingness and to will of his good pleasure. In other words, his desires become our desires. And so we'll find ourselves, our whole inclination, moving more towards pleasing God than honoring the temporary pleasures of sin. And sin doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be something that, 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 that is sexual. It's just whatever it is that takes our heart away from God. And so the more we begin to give our hearts to the Lord, the more we become men after his own heart. And I want to invite you to start a journey with me. I, I picked up these books here. I'm sorry, sister. <laughs> I'm investing. I picked up these books just for the men. And it's Scripture Confections. Uh, confessions. It's a collection. Life-changing words of faith for every day. Five books in one edition. Virtuous living, spiritual growth, healing, finances, and parenting. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to get the word. We have word, but we're going to get more word written on the table of our hearts. So our whole inclination will be towards the word, and that itself will be honoring God in all that we do. And then when life begins to confront us, we'll confront life itself with the word that's coming out of our heart.
Amen. Bless the Lord. And this is how we'll honor God. When he sees us acting like him, when he sees us responding to situations just like he would, it makes us men after God's own heart.